Hello, welcome everyone, uh, wherever you may be joining us from, uh, to Oceanology International Decarbonization Week. Uh, my name is Justin Manley. I'm happy to join you to moderate a panel discussion on autonomous and uncrewed systems on a course for net zero. If I could have the next slide, please. So in this session, uh, we're going to be addressing a, a series of topics. Uh, I'm going to kick us off with a little bit of an overview, reminding folks that the uncrewed maritime systems market, this is a growth market. Uh, there's dynamic technologies and applications. And of course, there's also some rapidly evolving business and policy concerns. So we're just going to set the stage with a few remarks. Uh, then we have two guests who will present perspectives from industry leaders, uh, including Xblue, our sponsor. Thank you for that. And then we will transition into an audience Q&A. And just as a reminder for all of you, uh, in, in 2021, we've all used many different platforms. There is an attendee question function. Uh, those questions will flow to me and I will be able to, uh, to help with the moderation. So that's what we're uh, setting out to do over the next uh, just over an hour. So if I could have the next slide, please. I'd like to open this this sort of discussion, right? We're talking about net zero, which uh, leads to words like sustainability and renewable. And I just wanted to, to remind everyone out there that uh, this field of uncrewed maritime systems or ocean robots uh, has actually been a leader in the engagement of renewable energy sources, uh, wave powered systems, wind, water powered, both buoyancy and temperature variances and solar systems are all uh, maturing and, and essentially on market. Everything you see on this slide is a product you could engage in and put to use today. So I think that's an encouraging sign. It's a nice way to start off this conversation and, and remind ourselves that our technology has been bringing sustainability and renewables uh, to bear for some time now. So if I could have the next slide, please. You know, so we ask ourselves, uh, what what is the role of uncrewed maritime systems? You know, there are there are environmental missions, and I I selected storm research to to talk about mostly because it's so much fun. Uh, you may have recently seen some news coverage: uh, sail drone uh, sailed one of their vessels into a hurricane. It's not the first time uh, ocean robots have entered hurricanes. Uh, in fact, the the storm glider team have been doing it so much they've developed their own logo. Right. So this is um, this is definitely a compelling application. And then if you're an engineer or just a sailor, you know, you observe photos like those in the bottom and, and you realize that we can do things with robots that, frankly, we would never do with a human occupied vessel. So this is uh, just one topic, one way that uncrewed maritime systems are contributing to a sustainable future. We can have the next slide, please. And this is just another example, which I'm using to remind everyone that the technologies we're talking about cross domain, right? So in this case, aerial systems, uh, drones, UAVs, UAS, which, whichever uh, moniker you'd like to use, are contributing to the study and management of marine mammals, for example. Um, some systems can deploy passive acoustic monitoring to help ensure that offshore construction operations are compliant with, with environmental regulations. Others, like you see on the top right, are actually collecting uh, biological uh, samples about whales to understand their health. So the technologies available to us and the environmental challenges we can engage are, are quite diverse and we should remember that as we go through this discussion. If I could have the next slide, please. And I like to, I always like to ground these kind of panels in recent market news, right? This is an industrial uh, enterprise. We are, we're talking about technologies that deliver value. And these are just a couple of news items that have come out in the past quarter. Um, why, why are these here? Well, just for example, carbon capture and sequestration. Much of the technology we talk about in this community was inspired by the historic field of offshore oil and gas. Carbon capture and sequestration presents an opportunity to essentially repurpose all of that technology, perhaps even some of the existing infrastructure, and continue to add both economic value to those organizations and, of course, environmental value and improving our, our situation towards sustainability. Um, other interesting news items, right? So uh, 
read exhibitions. Uh, this is all driven by oceanology. Most of us are joining us as oceanology attendees. So our, our friends in the UK with Bodie McBoatface. Uh, so Bodie is being directed at end of life oil field R&D questions, right? So this is an important topic area. And then most interesting, if you're following this field, uh, maritime autonomous surface ships, uh, autonomous cargo ships, whatever you'd like to call them, are another emerging and potentially very large market. Uh, and here we see that, including the idea of becoming large mobile batteries to transport renewable energy from uh, offshore to shore. Again, these are just a few highlights that I, that I point out to show that this field, uh, uncrewed systems, and sustainability, there are many intersections, many technology and market opportunities. So if I could have the next slide. Uh, this is just the, the end of my opening remarks. I just sort of wanted to set the stage and let everyone think about and understand we're in a big, exciting world here. Um, the, this is my reminder, attendees, as you listen to these remarks, don't be shy about putting your questions in the question box um, because after our next two speakers, uh, we are going to move to a dynamic Q&A, and, and we want to include you, even if we can't be with you in person. So with that, I'm going to hand this over uh, to Olivier from Mix Blue, who will take us through some of his remarks. And after that, we'll hear from Bjorn at Comfort. Olivier, the floor is yours, subject to technical uh, systems doing their job. <laughs> okay. Um, so maybe I can share my screen now? Yes, please do. So it's, uh, I hope everyone can see uh, my sharing, my screen sharing. Yes, it looks good here. Thank you. Thank you, Justine. Hi, everyone. I am uh, Olivier Cervantes. I'm the vice president uh, for the energy market at XBlue. And I've worked over the last, I uh, would say, a few years uh, with uh, the XBlue team uh, on uh, market adoption of uh, autonomous systems, which uh, uh, is uh, one of the key pillar, strategic pillar of our uh, developments uh, since uh, 2015, I would say. So in six years from now. Um, maybe uh, I, I will start uh, with, um, with a short uh, introduction uh, on uh, what is XBlue and what we do at XBlue. Uh, so one slide that uh, for me summarize uh, uh, what we do at XBlue uh, in mainly three main domains, three main activity, what we call maritime and autonomy, uh, uh, photonic uh, and navigation. And uh, today we will focus on maritime and autonomy, especially on autonomous systems and, and how they bring uh, value to the, to the market. Uh, I would summarize XBlue as a, as, as a technology leader pushing the boundaries uh, from the bottom of oceans to the depth of, uh, of space. Um, we go uh, beyond uh, borders, uh, and we do uh, we do so through an absolute uh, unique technology platform, uh, which uh, has make us uh, I would say has allow us to develop uh, more solutions for market every day, uh, thanks to a very uh, coherent and complementary uh, offer. Uh, the breadth and depth of our technology mastery opens up uh, an absolutely incredible potential. Uh, and you will see in this presentation the value of, uh, of this te technology master uh, in our uh, development in the autonomy domain. Um, it is the, the, the second slide about XBlue and the offering, uh, and then I will go into uh, more detail on, on, on autonomous systems. Um, but essentially, we see on the, on the, on the left the, the three domain, navigation, maritime autonomy, and photonics. And we have uh, developed uh, an offer from component through systems uh, throughout to solutions. Uh, what you see uh, on the left uh, right is in red uh, is our uh, latest development in terms of uh, unmanned surface vessel named Drix. Uh, uh, but we've been uh, working on autonomous sy systems since uh, uh, 20 years, I would say, uh, uh, at the very early stages of uh, autonomous underwater vehicle. At that time, I was uh, Already talking to uh, to Bjorn, to Bjorn Jalving, who is uh, with us today uh, from Kongsberg Maritime. Uh, I think at that time, Bjorn, you were at FFI, and and 
uh, in Norway, and uh, we were developing uh, together uh, inertial navigation system for uh, autonomous uh, vehicle. So we we have this uh, root and this DNA into uh, into autonomy systems. Um, so now you see a, a little video running on the on the right side of the Drix uh, uh, with uh, unique you will see uh, sailing capabilities, and uh, on the left side we see the integration of all the technology at X Blue. Um, uh, so we have uh, the a shipyard in the group. Uh, we have uh, also integrated uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, robotic uh, uh, company uh, who has developed all the software, all the intelligence of our autonomous systems. Uh, we have a service capability. We develop uh, inertial navigation systems, sonars, and motion systems. So all together, we manage to put a, a, a unique design, a unique. Uh, uh, capability uh, and we will see how it uh, uh, delivers uh, in the market. Um, so again, we, we, we have a, a unique situation in the south of France. I, I welcome all, uh, all, all our, our friends today who are attending uh, this webinar to, to come and, and, see, and visit us in the very nice area in the south of France where we have our campus uh, testing facilities and where we develop sonars uh, and we can uh, bring you at sea uh, to uh, see how uh, we use uh, Drix and how we use autonomous systems. Um, so this is uh, also a very important, uh, a very important topic. I think uh, I enter more now into the, uh, the subject of uh, of uh, decarbonize of the of subject of today. Uh, sorry, um, and as part of its. Uh, of our plan from 2021 to 2025, XBlue, at XBlue we have decided to revise and accelerate uh, our sustainability roadmap. And uh, this initiative uh, uh, is obviously aligned uh, on the strong actions ongoing at the European uh, level, stemming from the Green Deal, including the, um, the future corporate sustainability reporting directive, what we call the CSRD, and the European Taxonomy Regulation. Uh, so in 2021, XBlue has framed its roadmap for effective deployment over the next uh, years, uh, and the detailed review uh, of XBlue materiality analysis is ongoing, uh, which leads to the identification of uh, our quantified goals by mid-2022. Uh, but here I put the three main actions, uh, drivers, uh, that we already identify. Uh, so strongly support the market with an, uh, an offer uh, that is uh, significantly uh, contributing to climate change related trends. Uh, strengthen our actions to contribute internally to the six environment related objectives at European level, including carbon footprint. And the third point is about identifying precisely the possible threats of environment, environment social governance related trends to improve our resilience for the benefit of our stakeholders. So I wanted to uh, also, uh, probably we will discuss about that, how, how uh, we integrate in our organization uh, this, uh, this uh, European Green Deal and, uh, and the challenges of, uh, of doing that. Um, so if I come back uh, 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 um, for some time on, on autonomous uh, systematics blue and, and our expertise in the domain, this is an image of what uh, is the offer of XBlue today what we call the X-autonomy at sea. And uh, we have developed a set of capabilities from very shallow water, uh, so brown waters to uh, blue waters. Um, uh, and depending on the scope, uh, really uh, having uh, the right answer uh, so that uh, you will see we reduce uh, the exposure of uh, man at sea. <coughs> we also reduce the carbon footprint of uh, the survey operation. Uh, and we have uh, an increased uh, quality of the data, an increased uh, uh, efficiency of uh, the survey operations. And uh, obviously, one of the challenges is, is the communication. Uh, so here we have also uh, uh, developed what we name Cortex, uh, which uh, is uh, an embedded solution into our autonomous system that allows to communicate through SATCOM, 4G, uh, broadband radio, Wi-Fi, for example. Uh, 
uh, and allow you to control uh, your asset remotely, fully remotely, so from the shore, um, uh, and control the quality of the data, of course, and uh, control the navigation of your uh, autonomous uh, vehicles. One, one of the key uh, elements uh, here of, uh, of Cortex, uh, I will run the video, hopefully uh, you can see it uh, running. So this is, by the way, our nice uh, facilities uh, in the south of France, in La Ciotat Bay. Um, and you will see uh, an example uh, of obstacle avoidance. So the Drix have uh, acquired uh, a target and will uh, avoid it and resume its line mile. Obviously, uh, it's an example. Uh, we would need to show a much more complex environment to prove uh, you know, the efficiency of that, but we've been testing that uh, for some time, and it's, it's, this is a, a working a solution now, operational survey uh, solution. Uh, and I thought that the obstacle detection and avoidance module was uh, an important point to describe uh, in uh, autonomous systems. Um, and this is the last part of my presentation. Uh, so I, I don't want to spend too much time on, on the offering, but just it gives highlights of what we are doing at XBlue. But here, what are the benefits and challenges? Um, so first, on the path to net zero, we see autonomous system as being greener, faster, and better. Uh, I give a few numbers here uh, to uh, illustrate this, uh, this uh, position. Um, the fuel consumption, for example, uh, uh, and it leads directly to the carbon footprint, but the fuel consumption on the Drix is about two liters per hour at a service speed of eight knots. Uh, so you will see if you compare that to uh, uh, you know classical survey approach, uh, that uh, it's a massive reduction uh, uh, 80 times, 100 times, uh, maybe more uh, of, of the fuel consumption. And um, it's, uh, it's a subject of, of uh, I would say, of um, thinking uh, for sure, should we have uh, a, a diesel propulsion, an electric propulsion, uh, or uh, an hydrogen propulsion? Uh, this is something maybe we will we will discuss later to, today. Uh, but besides the, the, the consumption, uh, the autonomy system is reducing also the, the, the exposure, so the crew exposure at sea, the man exposure. Uh, it's going faster, um, and as I said in the introduction, it is uh, uh, of a better quality because the, the, the quality of the signals, the quality of the, of, the, of the sonars are enhanced by the silent approach of our uh, autonomous vessel. Um, so I give some numbers here uh, on the fuel uh, comparison between uh, a Drix and an Opportunity vessel. I compare uh, 50 liter a day compared to 2,000 liter a day, uh, or a, a footprint of uh, 0.52 compared to uh, 41.6. Um, uh, also, uh, we have seen that the processing time uh, and ma many factors on uh, the, the, the daily operation are heavily reduced. Um, and we go further, and we go further uh, uh, now at XBlue, uh, uh, because we want to enlarge the scope of autonomous system. So um, having payloads in a gondola is very interesting, but being able to um, tow system with unmanned system is something also uh, that uh, uh, we are very proud of and uh, that we are starting to push in the market. So we see here a Drix, our autonomous survey vessel, towing what we call Flipix. So it's a Aero TV, so it's an active antenna that stabilizes uh, automatically, uh, automatically uh, with respect to the seabed, okay, at a constant uh, altitude, and that carries uh, uh, sonar, side scan sonar, uh, and uh, magnetometer, for example. So with this offering, now we can come in the market with a full spread of sensor uh, that can be used for, uh, I would say, uh, shallow water up to 200 meter water depth, shallow water uh, geophysical surveys. And it's, I think, a real um, uh, move 
uh, towards the autonomy and it's a real move toward reducing the carbon footprint. So it's real, it's operational, and probably we'll discuss about that today too. So what a main surface vehicle will bring to the industry, uh, I would say a drastic reduction of the carbon footprint. It's less fuel, it's less data processing, it's quicker operations, it's no exposure of Manati, it's an increased data quality. And what are the challenges? It is my last slide. Uh, what are the challenges on, on, on the technology adoption? Uh, we've been uh, discussing in the, in, with our clients and uh, with our partners about, uh, uh, you know, uh, risk and environmental assessment. It has to be done. We have done it. We have built a new concept of operation. It's uh, almost like uh, taking a new white uh, sheet of paper and, uh, and, uh, thinking on how we should do the, uh, the, the surveys, how we should do the operations. Uh, there are challenges around uh, authorization to sell, about regulations, which are still ongoing and very dynamic. It's, I think, a topic of discussion also today. And uh, I put that in bold, the last point, because for me, it's a very important uh, thing, is that despite, uh, you know, what uh, we are talking about, decarbonization willingness, there is no real rules today uh, to motivate the use of unmanned technology. There is no real rule as we have seen that, for example, in some countries to, uh, to push the electric, uh, the electric um, usage of cars, electric propulsion, there, there has been some governmental uh, take on that. And today they are not. So it's, it's up to the willingness of the industry to move to uh, unmanned technology. And it's taking a bit of time. I have to say. Um, so this is my last point and my uh, conclusion. Uh, open for questions and for the chat uh, with uh, with you, uh, Bjorn and Justin. Thank you, Olivier. Um, so with that, we will transition. And uh, Bjorn, you're welcome to share your screen and, and share your remarks. And uh, just a reminder to the audience, I, I see one question come in, which is a good one. And uh, we will look forward to that discussion after Bjorn's remarks. Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, I hope you see my screen. We do. Great. <clears throat> okay, thanks for the opportunity to uh, present at this uh, panel. Been looking forward to that. I, uh, I think I'll, I'll probably mainly concentrate on trends and technology uh, more, than, uh, more than products themselves. So you, you will uh, hear some viewpoints on, uh, on, uh, on the developments. Um, and I, I think if you look at the maritime industry, the biggest thing with maritime industry today is, of course, uh, that it uh, emits around 2 to 3% of the total carbon dioxide of the, of the world. So that's a substantial contribution to the greenhouse gas that the world uh, experiences. To a greenhouse effect that the world has, and uh, and the major undertaking necessary with uh, goals uh, and milestones within 2030 and 2050 is of course to then reduce the carbon uh, um, emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions from the total maritime fleet. Uh, while uh, so and, and Kongsberg, as many other maritime companies, we are in the middle of that. Uh, journey transition to to uh, to actually get the total the complete maritime fleet towards uh, net zero for for this panel today uh, as i've understood with uh, the, the discussions up front uh, there is more than maritime transport is is we are also concentrating on on blue economies and and uh, energy uh, food minerals uh, blue, uh, activities happening on the ocean in addition to the transportation. And uh, I think a big picture now is that uh, offshore oil and gas has, because of the climate uh, uh, cha changes, entered sunset. How soon sunset will happen is, I mean, it's not super easy to say, but we are transitioning towards a, towards a greener world. 
So, uh, and we are transitioning towards uh, more blue economies because while as, uh, as the population in the world grows, uh, the ocean becomes more and more important to have good human life with necessary food, necessary uh, space, necessary transportation, uh, energy, and so on. So, and, and when we are now making these transitions to the new blue economies, I think building on human history, we really need to manage them sustainably from the start. And I think uh, our industry with uh, uh, autonomous and unmanned solutions, we have a huge role to play in enabling these transitions to new blue economies. Uh, I mentioned seaborne transport that becomes uh, that will become uh, eventually become uh, greenhouse gas neutral. Uh, but I also think uh, if we can deal with uh, with um, with virus, uh, tourism and leisure on the ocean is 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 a very nice way. Uh, for for human beings and a good activity, but it it but there is also vulnerable areas, so it has to be managed sustainably. With energy, we are we, when we will now start to build uh, build out offshore um, offshore wind. The, there should be an environmental design of the offshore wind fields and 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 an environmentally environment so so that the offshore wind fields do not destroy the marine ecology and uh, to ensure that we need marine eco marine ecological monitoring same same with minerals uh, marine minerals which could be important in the future and then the standard industries like of fishery that has a successful history of sustainable management aquaculture definitely needs it and new industries like kelp and uh, so i think to really have the enough information here it is really a, a crowdsourcing of a lot of platforms. Uh, there will be data from research vessels, marine robotics, uh, marine maritime vessels of any type, as well as coastal and seabed infrastructure, which, which in total contribute with enough data to really uh, understand and monitor the ecological development of the oceans. So, and then there will be international and national organizations that provide uh, ocean data platforms for for uh, and providing turning data into information and and then governing bodies, uh, national, uh, United Nations, international organizations, uh, taking informa information uh, probably also from uh, uh, private data platforms, and and then managing the ocean. So I think that's a big that's a big uh, big in picture and a very important step forward. When it comes down to uh, autonomous and, uh, and uh, unmanned solutions themselves. I think a few main technology trends and several of these have already been uh, mentioned by Olivier. Connectivity. We, we talk about autonomy, but I think in reality we talk about unmanned vessels, vehicles that have autonomy functions, but they are all, almost always connected. And there will be some sort of remote operation also, definitely autonomy. Uh, and uh, there is a trend of having unmanned and self-propelled vessels. And that's a big thing. Uh, because when, uh, when uh, vessels become unmanned, they become much smaller than the manned platforms. And, and by having them smaller, we reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, a lot. But also, the, in the maritime world, there will be, now be uh, propulsion systems themselves with new fuel, with new fuels, new uh, energy carriers that is uh, has much lower greenhouse gas emissions. And then, and then, as as men, as uh, Justin said, robotics themselves are great contributors because they uh, replace manned vessel operations and they do the same jobs or they complement. Uh, with a very low energy uh, cons uh, consumption and greenhouse gas emission. This is an example from a uh, um, survey company called Reach Subsea. They, have, uh, they, they are doing pilot studies of replacing a standard offshore support vessel. This is for mainly for IMR, inspection, maintenance, repair jobs. Typically 50 to 70 personnel 
uh, and, I uh, and, the, and the concept and the pilot is to replace that with an unmanned vessel of 25 meter length. And, the, and as you see on the, on the right, that significantly reduces capex, it reduces opex, as well as, uh, as daily CO2 emissions. In this case, it's a hybrid uh, vessel with battery and, uh, and uh, diesel. So, uh, and we are, it, it's a very exciting uh, world to live in. There are a lot of multiple platform trends within, uh, within our area. Uh, and uh, from a traditional manned vessels, we have now manned vessels with increased onshore monitoring and support, manned vessels with robotic force multipliers, unmanned vessels monitored from onshore, unmanned multi-domain operations, fleet operations, and even AUV and USV operations alone from, from shore. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll uh, dive a little bit more into these variants. I think it's too early to really say what will be the most successful uh, concept. But as with manned vessels, I think there will be a lot of concepts because there is a lot of a wide range of solutions to be solved. Uh, and the connectivity and remote operation will be central. Uh, and connectivity, maritime uh, radio, uh, 4G and 5G, and satellite communication makes connectivity more geographically available, lower cost, higher bandwidth. I think the, the uh, only thing that's sure is that this becomes better and better in the maritime environment. Uh, this is an example of a Consberg remote operation center. We are about to deliver these kind of centers. Typically, uh, have great video walls for situational awareness and then uh, near screen operator systems uh, where you actually control the objects as you would on a, on a bridge. And then I think there will be, in the remote operation centers, there will be several stages. Uh, a lot of vessels, manned vessels, will start with monitoring and support operations. Uh, expensive or highly qualified personnel will be on, on shore, and this happens already. Then we'll, there will be more direct control, and we'll move towards autonomous operations, and, uh, and finally fleet operations from remote operation centers. To make this transition happen, of course, autonomy is important. Within AUVs and USVs, I think uh, the traditional way for, for what has been an autonomous system has been to plan, collect the data, download the data, process the data, extract the data, and then act after, for instance, an AUV mission. We are, we are definitely moving towards a lot of more in-mission processing, and already uh, we have based on in-mission processing, extract in-mission uh, information and act in-mission. And this will only be more and more O. So this is kind of mission autonomy. Then, of course, also building on navigation autonomy, as, as was uh, shown uh, in the video from Olivier. And this is an example of, of, of pipeline tracking, where you combine several data. If you have interesting data, you can, uh, in mission, decide to maybe take a better uh, uh, optical image. I talked about the main uh, main challenge of reducing CO2 emissions, and fuels of the future is a big thing. But there are several ways uh, to reduce uh, greenhouse gas. It's about uh, minimizing the energy consumption of, uh, of, the, of the vessels themselves and the robotics themselves. And there are a lot of automation that can be done to reduce energy consumption. Uh, and it's very important to have a, uh, a max, maximize the energy conversion efficiency. How, how efficient is your engine system, your power system, and your propeller system? And how is the totality, and how is the totality uh, uh, when used in your operations? And then, of course, as uh, there's a lot of talk about, the, the new clean energy sources. Uh, in, to a large extent, uh, hydrogen-based uh, ba fuel cells, uh, uh, based uh, fuels, uh, where then the creation of these uh, production of these fuels would be co would come from uh, greenhouse gas uh, neutral uh, energy sources like power and sun. 
by minimizing energy consumption and maximizing energy conversion efficiency there's a lot of lot of technologies a lot of steps things making this happen and uh, and as an example would you imagine if on a big uh, on a big a big tanker or uh, or uh, a bulker uh, moving uh, from one continent to another if you have green if you have clean hulls you you reduce energy uh, consumption with more than 14 percent and that's why for instance Kongsberg and Georgia has entered um, a, a, a partnership collaboration where we, uh, as as there are lawn movers on the on the green uh, lawn, lawn, so in in our, our your private house, you can have a ro robot that clean your vessel all the time, and by that way reduce energy consumption a lot. And by the way, by always having clean house, you do not have transfer of invasive species from one continent to another. So a lot of development trends, efficiency and energy reduction, electrification and batteries, super, super uh, central, and also a few transitions. And then uh, a few slides on the on the robotics. I think this is an example of Ocean Infinity. Uh, I I was uh, I was uh, in the uh, very central in the early days of the Kongsberg uh, AUV. Um, business and for years i would say almost 15 years the, the concept operation was to have one server vessel and one aov and then some clever guys came around and say but well, if we have the big uh, expenses of one uh, uh, surface vessel why not get five times the data so i think that's an excellent example of how uh, by having multiple ro robots from one host vessel you really get a very strong force multiplier, and, and this concept is now being developed for uh, uh, for naval vessels. We'll see it in uh, in uh, in, I, in um, research. We'll see similar uh, <coughs> concepts in uh, in um, inspection, maintenance, repair, and so on. The combination of, of manned and um, manned platforms, and and uh, we call it also man and man teaming. So again, an example of how uh, a naval solution would be. And uh, maybe the, not that very different concepts from a future survey vessel or research uh, vessel. Uh, and, and then we have the fleets of unmanned vessels, like uh, again, Ocean Infinity with Armada. Quite, uh, quite impressive and quite uh, uh, re revolutionary. And I mentioned the concept from Reach Subsea where instead of, uh, they want to do ROV operations, but instead from a manned vessel, they will do it from an unmanned vessel. And uh, this is uh, maybe take going one step forward. It's uh, building uh, underwater vehicles, autonomous underwater vehicles with long endurance. In the, in the case of the Huguen endurance, the AV itself has 15 days endurance, covers, it can go from Europe to America. And uh, with a synthetic aperture sonar, you can uh, you can in one mission, in one dive, uh, cover uh, 1,110 square kilometers with three centimeter resolution. Of course, advanced autonomy functions and uh, also super accurate navigation uh, can be used for commercial naval applications. Uh, and then all kind of connectivity, remote monitoring and supervision, as I've been illustrating, as well as the shore to shore operation concept. So in summary, I would say <laughs> the future is uh, is both uh, both bright, very challenging, very interesting, and a lot of fun. There are a lot, uh, there are uh, uh, for and within autonomous uh, vessels and man solutions, uh, I th <clears throat> there are a lot of opportunities. I think as we've been discussing, main drivers are lower capex, lower opex, and lower CO two emissions. Connectivity, autonomy, and remote operations uh, will build on system on very solid system architectures, because it's necessary to have these solutions scale, scale to fleets of robotics as well as scale to fleets of uh, traditional maritime vessels. So uh, the, the the architectures that we build now will be very important and very interesting to follow. 
there will be several competing concepts and uh, and i think uh, but and there will also be uh, several parallel concepts in operation reliability and robustness will be the determining factor every time you let a robotic system go away you need to be sure it comes back and uh, then just one sentence about Kongsberg. We are a technology provider to uh, to uh, uh, to to um, vessel owners and service providers. We provide the technology, uh, uh, so that's that's our mission. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Bjorn. And uh, so if you stop sharing, I think now hopefully what the audience should see uh, will be our three smiling faces. Um, and uh, we will move into the, the Q&A now. And I will remind the audience, you may submit questions. I've seen a couple come in and we will start using them. Um, so I guess I'd like to, uh, there, there's the, in my mind, we have two very powerful themes to think about here. One, of course, is technology, and, and you both did an excellent job of summarizing innovations and creative solutions and, and emerging trends. And then, of course, there's sort of the business case, the, you know, practical realities of putting technology to work. Um, so I'd like to start uh, with the question. So the question came in, and, and this particular audience member may have missed my opening slides. Um, the question's about uh, wind power, solar, uh, you know, essentially renewable energy sources as a way to power and drive uncrewed systems. Um, and so as a reminder, uh, there are many solutions out there. There are robotic sailboats. There are robotic uh, solar-powered boats. There are robotic wave energy systems. Um, but in your cases, both of your companies are focused on solutions that, that do not use that approach. You either use stored energy and batteries or perhaps um, generators. Could you comment from a technical perspective on why that's the current dominant trend in, in the products you're bringing to market? Um, and I, I, either one of you is, is willing to step in. I, I'm not going to call on anyone first, but I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on your selections in that regard. Uh, maybe if, if I if I start, I, I think th there will be uh, there will be many par parallel power sources out there, as you said. But I think uh, for the majority of vessels and vehicles, uh, there will be some uh, some main solutions. And uh, and uh, whenever uh, uh, endurance range allows, the best way to store electrical energy is in batteries. So that's that's why I think when you, when you see uh, robots that uh, that kind of with like two weeks endurance or uh, or uh, or vessels that will are coastal vessels, short uh, distance maritime transportation ferries, they will have batteries because and then they will charge regular because it is like it's like an electric car. It's the most simple best system to use for for kind of a vast majority of applications. Then, if you look at maritime transport between continents, deep sea, the uh, the batteries are not the efficient way of storing energy, and that that's when we need the new uh, fuel, uh, fuel uh, new fuel sources. And um, I think that's still to be determined. The most uh, most players in the maritime world, they uh, believe it will be hydrogen or a hydrogen derivative, like ammonium or. Uh, uh, or hydrogen itself, or uh, methane, uh, synthetic methane, for instance. So uh, it, it, it remains to be played out, but it's, uh, I think uh, that will be uh, interesting to follow. For, for, kind of, for specific robotics, I think there, there will be more specific solutions and a wider variety. Yeah. Thank you. Olivier, comments? No, yeah, I, I agree with what Bjorn said. Uh, it's, um, there, there are some uh, constraints, uh, you know, uh, to, to answer. And obviously, when you start uh, looking at uh, energy like uh, the wind, uh, uh, you, so say drone, I think, for example, they, uh, they, they, they took this approach, very interesting. Um, uh, then it's about of what is the scope your, of your operation? What, what sort of power do you need uh, on your unmanned system? Uh, and probably, uh, the cell drone is answering to a number of applications as it is today. 
Uh, again, what we have been looking at uh, when we developed our uh, unmanned surface vessel at X Blue was, you know, the capacity of energy you have in one liter of fuel. You know, how can you get one kilowatt? And and as Bjorn said in his, uh, one of his uh, slides, is uh, reducing, you know, the, the consumption. It's a triangle, you know, on uh, uh, re reducing the, the consumption. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, it's. Uh, we see that L L um, battery, for example, on the Drix, if we want to power the Drix with battery, we will need seven tons of battery. So, you know, the equation does, doesn't, does not work. And the carbon footprint is, is uh, not ideal at all, if you look at it this way. Uh, so we, we took probably the, the side of saying, okay, uh, we prefer to uh, have two meters per hour of diesel or fuel rather than seven tons of, of battery, which makes the business case completely, uh, you know, impossible to, uh, to achieve. So uh, I think we are on the on the on the path. Uh, it, depending on the scope, if you have to recover, launch and recover subsea assets, it will be uh, very different to uh, uh, measuring uh, oceanographic parameter in the water column. So it really depends on the scope. Really depends on. Uh, uh, on the capacity of the, of the of the assets. Yeah, thank thank you thank you both. And I, and I would say, sort of from my perspective, um, you know, those systems that I opened my remarks with, right, the the ones that are powered by say waves, they also carry solar panels to recharge their batteries, and they have very clear payload limitations. Um, the solar powered robot boat that I, so, I showed you jumping through the waves, right, um, that. That company, as I understand it, is exploring carrying fuel and generators to extend and augment their range because of the things you pointed to. Um, and the sail drone surveyor, the very, very large uh, new sail drone, as I understand it, also is a, a multiple power source, right? So it has some solar panels. It tries to use wind for propulsion, but it also, as I understand it, is charging generators. Uh, and that is, is driven in a sense by the payload requirements you've alluded to. So. What I would take away to sort of close this question for the audience is that, you know, all the technologies are in play. Uh, selecting a solution that fulfills the end requirement is complicated and it's driven by in engineering choices, economic choices and environmental choices. So uh, we must balance that. I'm going to I'm going to change the subject a little bit. There's a, there's an excellent question here um, coming from an operational perspective and end user perspective, and it relates to the business model of technologies in these markets. And recognizing that you are both essentially technology providers, you make solutions that service companies typically take to market and sell their services to other end customers, right? But from that perspective, um, what do you see as incentives for those service companies to change their business model? Uh, the question recognizes that the current business model of, of many of these providers is, is selling uh, essentially manpower, selling the humans, selling the ships, selling the capital assets that have already been amortized on the balance sheet uh, for as high a day rate as they can. And we are now coming forward saying, hey, you should change your capital base. You should not bill people hours. You should bill robot hours, right? Um, so it, it's a great question. Uh, I recognize that essentially you're not service companies, right? So you're not gonna comment from that perspective, but certainly you work with a lot. So I, I'd welcome your thoughts on yeah. that great question. Maybe uh, I can start uh, if, you, if you allow Bjorn on that one. Um, one of my slides was about, you know, our capability to uh, provide the services. Uh, I don't know if, 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 uh, if you have it in mind. Uh, I think it is essential in this, uh, market in the autonomy market to support the client to support the survey contractor we cannot just be a technology vendor we cannot just hand over the assets uh, and, uh, and and stop the you know the, the, the support is will be probably a very very big part of the adoption of the technology in the market it's more than support it's going along with our clients to um, uh, you know, educate them on the concept of operation, work together on the risk assessment, um, and, uh, you know, build together the next uh, model on how we will do uh, the, the surveys. Um, 
So to answer the question on what motivates the survey contractor to move, you know, to uh, to autonomous system, I think it's uh, it's driven by their clients. You know, it's driven first by uh, uh, you know this willingness of the world to have a greener and better world, uh, to go on 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 the path of net zero. And today we are seeing, you know, uh, organization uh, such as uh, Total Energy, uh, Equinor, Orsted, uh, a lot, a lot of uh, majors are, uh, are are willing to move into this direction. For me, I would say too slowly still, but they are willing to move into this direction. Um, and then you have, you know, some survey companies who um, uh, have appeared recently in the last uh, few years. And want to differentiate, and want to uh, you know they are starting with uh, no assets, and they have this opportunity, this big opportunity to actually take market share, because they will have uh, a quicker, safer, better, greener approach uh, than uh, traditional uh, methods. So it's a very good question. Uh, we are you know asking ourselves this question all the day, but as, where we are today is to keep the technology. And to make sure that the market as a whole, the ecosystem, can adopt the technology, and there are various challenges into that. We'll hopefully discuss it today. Uh, but this is uh, what we do. So it's a little bit of a change of position as a technology, uh, you know, supplier. We have to go further in what we did in the past uh, in our um, proposal of a new uh, new concept and new technology. Thank you, Olivia. We might have lost you a little bit at the end there, but um, good, great remarks. Um, Bjorn, comments? Yeah, to compliment Olivier, um, I, I think uh, historically, uh, as you mentioned, Justin, has been, it's, been a bit, it's been an issue, I think, at least for a technology company point of view, that why don't the energy company or the clients go for these new great solutions? And then, of course, I understand the, <laughs> the service providers. Why, uh, why do new technology? When the uh, when the uh, when the clients are happy, but uh, uh, I think with a with a change in oil price that happened, uh, the that that changed the uh, oil and gas industry a lot. I, th I think in general we see a lot more uh, eagerness uh, drive to save cost in the oil and gas markets, and uh, and with the. Uh, with, with, with everything now going on in offshore wind, I think that's also uh, a ch an opportunity for change because the, the new ways of doing things will be established, new processes, new procedures, and also in offshore wind, if we, if we look at the full value chain. Uh, the green shift is dependent on uh, uh, sustainable energy becoming uh, um, uh, competitive. And regulations will be uh, and taxes will be one way to make green energies competitive, but also offshore wind operations has to be ex have to be extremely efficient. So uh, be because uh, so not, so I think there will be a drive now, at least in the two energy segments, really to to make the technology sh shift happening. So um, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Thank you, Bjorn. Yeah, I, um, so I'll, I'll, if I could sort of synthesize some remarks and one sort of historical data point just for amusement, I'm sure um, some of us remember. So the things we see going on with AUVs for deep water survey, for example, um, I'm dating myself, but, but I remember a day when deep toe was the default. Right? And uh, then along came the idea of instead of two ships and a deep toe, you have one ship and one AUV, and that was a profound change. And I may be mistaken, but I think it was BP was the first operator who specified in an RFP that they wanted AUV data, right? That change, and this is sort of a specific answer to the individual who posed the question, um, an operator changed their RFP, and therefore the service companies <coughs> had to buy AUVs, right? So um, that's one very clear lever, um, and then I think Another one I hear being alluded to, uh, even beyond regulation and taxation, is economic forcing functions. And my impression of this is, as offshore wind becomes more common, the amount of infrastructure in the ocean 
actually goes up. We need more wind turbines to generate the energy we retrieve from one oil well, for example. So now we have more assets in the ocean to maintain and inspect those assets, we must get more efficient because we need to, you know, and this is where these systems come in. So I'm hearing about uh, customer choice. I'm hearing about market forces. And of course we've, we've mentioned and throughout there is this theme of regulation and sort of the public sector's influence on the market. So um, no, a very interesting discussion. I'd like to stay on this angle for just a moment. Um, we have 15, 20 more minutes. I, I see an no interesting technical question we'll come back to. Um, at the risk of going too far into being sort of too open and honest with ourselves and our audience, um, I'm curious if you could comment on your perspectives as to the balance of true imperative towards transitioning to green uh, that you see in the marketplace versus, I'll use the words, lip service, or sometimes people use terms like greenwashing or blue washing, right? We, we hear a lot about this topic. We're here talking about it. Personally, I'm a huge believer. I see a lot of challenges. Olivier did a great job of explaining why uh, internal combustion and liquid fuels have excellent technical advantages, right? So it, to the extent you're, you're both comfortable, could you just sort of comment on how you see that social, technical, societal interplay playing out in your own experiences. And please don't, obviously, we, we don't need to get uh, too too much into dirty laundry, but I'm really curious how powerful a force this is, how fast you see it unrolling in your own perspectives. So I welcome just any remarks you have on that front. So maybe I could start then, uh, then uh, re representing a European company that's not a member of the European Union, but uh, but we do have a very strong uh, relationship, so we follow all the rules. So so uh, uh, and uh, I would say uh, from a Consper maritime point of view, uh, Olivier mentioned um, the EU taxonomy, and the Consper maritime will be compliant with the EU taxonomy reporting, which is financial reporting regulated in Europe. Uh, and, and the whole purpose of it is really to avoid greenwashing and have for the financial markets true uh, reports on the, the greenness of, of the business. And uh, <laughs> when, you put, when you put that to, the, to, to industry, industry uh, is like ESG, industry uh, awakens. And, uh, and uh, we, I think we also see it in financial market. Uh, if, you, if you look at uh, what's happening, uh, funding for green initiatives are much, or, I mean, they are relatively easily available if you have good, good uh, projects. So I think there is a lot of true imperative happening out, out in the business world. Uh, this, of course, is dependent on uh, international regulations it is independent on solar and wind becoming competitive. I think that has to do has a certain to extent uh, will be dependent on tax on on uh, carbon dioxide emissions. But um, if if the if the Europe Europe is has definitely got its acts together, and if the world can get its acts together, I think uh, it will happen. Thank you, Olivier. Any thoughts? No, yeah, I, I think it's happening already. You know, I think it's um, it's a move. Uh, I see that uh, in Europe, at, at least uh, in some part of, part of the world, I see uh, um, that people, you know, it starts with the populations uh, are, are taking, uh, you know, this awareness on um, uh, living better for ourselves, for our children. Uh, and it's, it's moving to a political level. Uh, and we see that for cars, now uh, and and we see that in, in 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 the food in the packaging of the food in in, in the shipment of uh, of uh, you know uh, our goods also with what just happened with this virus with the covid uh, we have uh, you know taken some measure even at is blue we, we we understand you know that um, i'm careful myself about the, my carbon footprint you know uh, more and more should i travel should i you know, with, with the new media, with the new communication capabilities. So it's a whole 
a sphere, I think, uh, of uh, going greener. It's happening already. There, are, it's, I don't think you know. It could be perceived as a, a greenwashing a few years ago, maybe, but I don't think it is anymore. Um, I think there is a lot of uh, fundings at the European Union also to push R&D and to push technology towards, uh, you know, a greener uh, and, and reducing the car carbon footprint of, uh, of all uh, these industries, uh, from space uh, to the, 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 you know, the underwater applications. Uh, but it's taking time, you know. It's I think as 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 a world we are very uh, good when we hit the wall. Uh, yeah, and we hit the wall, I think, <laughs> a couple of years ago, 18 months ago, and we we reacted, I think, uh, with uh, bad uh, bad and good things. Uh, but hopefully, we are not we will not hit the wall, and we will be uh, very responsive and continue this development that we started for me, uh, I would say, uh, five to ten years ago. Very good. Thank you. Thank you both. I will. And I'll add, so I'm, I'm in the United States. Um, I think the dynamics may be somewhat different, but I would agree with the trends. Um, so here, the uh, acceleration and significant growth of investment driven by what we might call ocean impact um, or general impact. So the role of finance, uh, the role of insurance, right? So in the United States, we've, we've had some hurricanes. We, we typically do wildfires. There, the, you know, the insurance industry is a powerful lever. And so we do see these trends uh, creeping through. Uh, here, they may be a little more driven by the market imperatives than the public sector regulation. That's, that's kind of the way we do things here, but but I would agree with, with the trends. I'm, um, I have one more question I wanna come back to as our closeout, but, but we have a few more, we have enough time here. I'd like to go to a question that came in, which is sort of more again, back to the technology. And, and it relates to the question of do these smaller vessels, right? So these, these uncrewed and autonomous systems are just physically smaller. Um, the, the question is sort of about maintenance and life cycle costs and whether part of there's a savings to be had here. And so I'd ask you to hypothesize from both an economics, cost of utilization, cost of operation, and perhaps from an environmental impact, right? So as we see large crude, uh, fuel powered vessels being replaced. Let's not worry about transportation. Just thinking about the industries we support here, ROV inspection, pipeline survey. Uh, can you comment about the, does size and complexity lead to significant savings here? Uh, or are all the savings embarked really just in the reduction of operator human being costs, right? So we're taking away operator salaries and we're replacing it with not with different operators, fewer human beings. You know, can you comment on the savings you, you perceive in the market? And is it a fair question? I, I hope it's sufficiently clear. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, yes, well, uh, the savings are, 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 are as we see it, but again, with the return on experience that we have, huh, which, which, you know, we're on the way, we're on the way. Um, but um, the, the assets are and will be lighter and smaller so by this factor we will reduce uh, uh, opex cost uh, and it's not here only uh, about the crew it's about you know the, the overall you know um, uh, cost that you have on a vessel of this type this, these vessels will be very complex you know they will be probably much more complex they are much more complex than current uh, vessels okay so um I think one very important point that is related to cost is the reliability. Because if the systems, these systems, these autonomous systems are not reliable enough, then your cost might be a very important, you know, at the end for, for the project. So redundancy, redundancy on these on this, uh, systems is a key for me uh, on the path to reliability and reduction of costs. Uh, and then to answer more directly on the question, uh, the, 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 the cost will be reduced because of the efficiency of, the, of these systems. Autonomous robots are very efficient in a, in a global way, you know. Uh, underwater, surface, in the air, they are uh, coherent, uh, they are reproducing, you know, the exact path, the exact line, they are um, 
in this way, better than a human, and they work 24 hours a day, seven days, if they are redundant and reliable. So there are a lot of axes, uh, maybe uh, Bjorn will comment in more detail, but there are a lot of axes of, of cost savings behind the, uh, the man, uh, uh, the man, you know, saving at sea, because we will still have people, staff, you know, online, onshore, with different skills uh, to, uh, to remotely supervise uh, these robots. Thank you, Olivia. Bjorn, any thoughts? Yeah, uh, it's, it's hard to add more value, I guess. I think Olivia uh, mentioned it. Why the virtual, much smaller vessels uh, and uncrewed vessels with no, with kind of no human on board, the vessels become much simpler, much less steel, and uh, a lot of maintenance and cost uh, goes down and energy consumption. So it's, um, I, I showed one example from one company which which has their uh, their figures out on the on the web. So it's it's public data, and they and they they showed uh, they show in their uh, in their system a reduction of sixty five percent in capex and opex and. Uh, I'm sure there will be other uh, other reductions for other type of operations and vessels, but reductions are significant. Uh, and um, and there's also maybe another aspect, and that the ocean the ocean is a host is sometimes a very nice place, but it's also a hostile place, and it's huge. And uh, so it also inc actually increases HMS uh, HSC human safety. Yeah. By, by having less people on uh, out in the oceans during kind of uh, challenging work operations. Great. Yeah, thank you both. Certainly insightful comments. Um, and I think the reliability is a great one, right? We, uh, uh, there was a time not long ago when press releases would be put out saying, oh, you know, a hundred kilometer survey run or, you know, cumulative thousand kilometers of survey data collected. And I think we've all um, become comfortable with the fact that we no longer need to put out such statistics. We, we mostly understand that these things work fairly well. They are efficient. There's a great deal of trust built up. And now we have the luxury of focusing on the economic value proposition, not simply the functionality, right? So it's an exciting time if, if you're, um, again, I'm dating myself, but I remember plenty of these robots that didn't do what they were supposed to do and lots of time wasted, you know, trying to fix silly things that we that just work today. So it's an exciting time. Um, I'm gonna, we have a sort of five, six minutes left here. I'm not seeing anything else in the Q&A box. I'd like to, I'd like to sort of close out with some uh, some visioning and some hypothesizing about the future. We have talked a lot about state of the art, currently available technology. We've referred uh, just sort of by nature to an industry that we all know quite well, which is typically energy, right? So for the most part, we're very familiar with oil and gas and the transition to wind. Uh, we've alluded to transportation and shipping, but if you imagine we do this panel again in, in 10 years, right? So this is the, the UN ocean decade is underway, right? And there's all this interest. So, you know, in roughly 10 years from now, could you take a guess as to a market area, an ocean economy area, something like that, that we haven't talked about that you think will have been significantly impacted by the technologies we're talking about. So outside the bounds of transportation and energy, what are you excited about the growth of our technology and our opportunity to deliver both economic and environmental value in the ocean dynamic? If you've got some ideas and you'd care to, I'm not asking for predictions that we're gonna hold you to in 10 years, but just what's on your mind? What are you, what are you excited about moving forward? Um, and, and either of you feel free to jump in. I, I, didn't, I didn't prepare you for that question. So you're allowed to take a moment. <laughs> I, I could, uh, maybe I, I start and then Oliver go. Um, I, I think um, there's one, one, one technical topic we haven't discussed a lot and that's, that's the digitalization. So in, in 10 years, I think uh, we will be very used to kind of d dealing with the robotics in the same way as we deal with our, uh, with our personal uh, devices. It, also, the industry has been digitalized uh, and transformed as our personal lives. So uh, and, and I think robots are kind of 
helping the transition of the whole maritime industry because when, when you have a robot you really want to to digitalize all the, the, the data processing turning ter, turning data into information and, and automate automating uh, work operations so but when, it, but when it comes to kind of the larger vision i uh, uh, i think um, there, there, maybe there will be multi multi domain or multi function uh, areas out in the ocean. Maybe there will be combination of offshore wind and uh, and type of aquaculture. Maybe actually actually uh, for instance offshore wind will have positive impact on uh, on amount of fish. Uh, we are usually very afraid of offshore wind, but. I think everyone who has seen that when you put a structure down on the seabed, there is more sea life around it. <laughs> and then if you have a wind, far, wind park, I think you can either combine with other other functions like of, like uh, aquaculture or various stuff, or maybe it actually becomes a wildlife habitat for, for fish where you don't troll and then the the whole ocean becomes more filled with ocean because they they that's where they uh, the, the species uh, animal uh, kind of they they are freely growing and then they go out uh, in the open zones for for catching i don't know i think um, i think the future is bright if we make ocean design if we en environmentally design uh, now take the option take the opportunity to environmentally design and monitor and run these new economies. I think really think that the future is bright. Thank you, Bjorn. Olivia, thoughts? Yeah, I, I, you know, first of all, I look back, I look back 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, when, uh, when the AUV technology, uh, you know, uh, more or less started in, in the domain and, and seeing where we are today and how mature is the technology and it took all this time for the market to adopt it but it is answering a, a lot of uh, questions and it has allowed you know the exploration of oceans uh, to go beyond the, the limits and today now if i put myself in the shoes of today and i look in the future there is a demand there is a very high demand for uh, the knowledge of the oceans when i say knowledge of the oceans you know it's the water column is the seabed there is an increase in demand by by countries if you look at uh, countries like uh, the united states the uk australia um, many countries uh, need to map their borders need to map the exclusive uh, the economic exclusive zone in the next uh, years and if you do that with classical methods you won't make it you won't make it so there is a demand first, there is a very strong demand to do it and then to do it uh, uh, in a greener in a greener way. So there is a demand, uh, there is a willingness to do it, there is the technology readiness now, but we are on the way. What we uh, discussed today is, uh, you know, uh, uh, the very early stages. We are doing that for, you no, know, we are in the prototype and we are starting to see, you know, some uh, industrialized solutions. It is very early stage on that. Many challenges to go through. I am sure. I am sure that in ten years, um, we will uh, use this technology as force multiplier to explore in a greener world the oceans. And there are many markets, many markets where this is required in the defense, in the energy sector, in the fishery market, in the scientific world. Uh, you know, understanding better the the currents the dynamic of the oceans and the impact on the weather on the climate change is a key element uh so yes i'm very confident uh and i really hope that uh, uh, at the political level and also uh, uh, at the highest level of the ecosystem in our market um, we will uh, agree and push towards uh, uh, you know the development of this technology and towards uh, using more autonomous systems because i strongly believe in it and it's not just because you know i have a x blue hat uh, uh, I, I i really uh, you know even myself uh, use more and more intelligence artificial intelligence in my house uh, for uh, you know a, a greener approach so uh, i'm a really uh, a fan of of this move and i i i trust uh, that in 10 years we will uh, i would like to see this pitch again maybe 
and, uh, and, 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 and see where we are. But uh, yeah, I'm positive. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and I will uh, quick. So there's a question about uh, the affordability of these tools. I will use that and uh, my, my wind down remarks here to suggest uh, uh, this, of course, uh, is a, 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 a webcast coming to us with, with read exhibitions. And, and we, most of us perhaps who have logged in, are familiar with Oceanology International. Um, there are many variants of these tools. There are affordable variants, lower cost. They should be on display at Oceanology um, next year in London. And I can certainly say to, to both of my, uh, my panelists, I, I hope to see both of you there personally. I'm looking forward to the chance, um, raising a beverage, coffee or otherwise together and continuing this discussion because yes, the next 10 years will be very exciting. And uh, so thank you, Xblue, for sponsoring this webinar. Thank you, uh, Read Exhibitions, for putting it together. And even though we can't really see you, uh, we as the panel thank all of you out there in the internet who have logged on. So we're at time. Uh, with that, I will uh, say we will conclude. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Justin and Bjorn.